Compound Future on the Moon. Apollo to Artemis. With Andy Saunders. Welcome back to the Cosmic Companion. I'm James Maynard. This week, we look at the Apollo and Artemis programs, discussing how these first missions to the moon set the stage for the next step in human evolution, becoming an interplanetary species. We're going to be talking with NASA historian Andy Saunders. His new book, Apollo Remastered, is filled with never before seen and newly remastered photographs exploring the history of humanity's first forays for our planetary companion. The engines are on. And the Apollo Four, program, three, one of the greatest accomplishments one, in human history, zero. lifted we off. Hey, <laughs> see what I did there, huh? Oh. It lifted off in 1961 when President John F. Kennedy announced that the United States is going to put an astronaut on the moon before the end of the decade, a goal many people at the time considered impossible. The program faced numerous challenges, including the tragic deaths of astronauts Gus Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chafee in the Apollo 1 fire. However, NASA and its partners persevered, making significant improvements to space technology. In 1969, the Apollo 11 mission successfully landed astronauts Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin on the moon. Five additional missions to the lunar surface, as well as the successful failure of Apollo 13 showed that we could send humans to the moon and bring them back safely to Earth, fulfilling the dream of John Kennedy. The Apollo program also laid the foundation for future missions, including the first U.S. space station Skylab and the Apollo Soyuz test project, the first international human mission beyond our planetary cradle. The Apollo program also had significant impacts on culture, capturing the public's imagination, inspiring a new generation of scientists, engineers, and explorers. The success of the Apollo program captured the imaginations of people around the globe. And the Apollo program not only demonstrated the incredible incredible capabilities of human technology and engineering, but also marked a major milestone for the future of human evolution. Next up, we talk with Andy Saunders. We're going to discuss his new book, Apollo Remastered, and talk about how his work exploring NASA's Apollo archives in search of unseen photographs from humanity's first tentative steps to the stars. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are a fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth. And we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. This week on The Cosmic Companion, we are happy to be joined by Andy Saunders. He is a NASA expert and historian and a whole lot more. And his new book, Apollo Remastered, gives us a new look at the Apollo missions in hundreds of previously unseen and remastered photographs. Welcome to the show, Andy. Well, thank you for having me on. Yeah. So first, I always love to get the origin story of authors and uh, creators. And what's what's your story? How did you 
become involved in a life in science? Well, I've just always had an obsession with specifically the Apollo moon landing since childhood. Um, I was obs obsessed with anything that could fly. I was always making paper airplanes, little helicopters, remote control planes. I had the space Lego. <clears throat> but really, rockets were kind of the ultimate flying machine to me. Um, the moon, had a, I had a fascination just with the moon. I remember looking at it through a small telescope. Again, when I was very young, just a just a cheap toy telescope and being amazed at how that two-dimensional disc suddenly became three-dimensional, mm -hmm. became a world you could visit in a rocket. So when I learned that actually people have done that, I was born a couple of years after Apollo 17, so I don't remember the missions. But since learning that, I've just always had an obsession with them um, and also always, always been very into photography. So here was an opportunity to basically unite those those two passions by working on this film. That's great. And so how did this all, how did this particular project come about? It, it's, it was born out of really frustration of two things, not, not being able to see Neil Armstrong on the moon. Mm -hmm. One of the most important moments in history, I would like to see Armstrong on the moon. And I've, since I was very young, conscious that we've never been able to because he held the camera. So the photographs we see are actually of, of Buzz Aldrin. So that concept always drove me mad. But also the quality of, of the photographs that we've always seen, there's something not quite right. They never presented that well. I think we get so taken by the content, which, you know, is inherently incredible footage, that we miss the fact that technically they're not very good. But that doesn't make sense because they used... You can see here they use the, like the best cameras, the best lenses, the best photo lab. Film is in, incredibly high quality film. We should be seeing them right. better, but we weren't. And I, and I couldn't really figure out why. And the reason is everything we've seen has been based on duplicate film. So when they got back to the moon, the original film's too important. It's too delicate to be handled multiple times. So it went into this frozen vault in Building 8 at Johnson Space Center. And it's remained almost untouched since. And everything you know, the handle is is the master dupes, they're called. So these master copies, lower quality copies, or copies of those, or an internegative of a copy of a copy. And it goes on and on. Mm -hmm. And with every every generation, there's a degradation in quality. That's accelerated in the internet world because someone will make a JPEG and someone else will brighten it and save it again as a JPEG and put it on social media and it's compressed. And it just hit me the most important moments in history, the most important photographs, the most important film they're being seen in a progressively worse state as time goes on. And they're being seen by a progressively bigger audience. And that just drove me nuts. That's, things should get better, not worse. Absolutely. Right, right. However, that original film, the film that was actually in the cameras on the moon, finally made it out of this frozen vault and available as these super high resolution uh, scans. And applying digital processing techniques to those enables us to see how we should always have seen these, perhaps almost as clearly as the astronauts themselves witness these amazing moments. Wow. And you now there are hundreds of photos in the book, but you started, if I have this right, with something like 35,000 raw images. Where did you begin? How did you get through a project of that magnitude? I basically broke it down by mission. So there's some pre-Apollo in there, but beyond that, it's the crewed mission, the manned crewed missions from Apollo 17 through to Apollo, from Apollo 7 through to Apollo 17. So I basically went through it mission by mission. So already that 35,000, you know, you can narrow it down and say, right, today or this month or the next few months is Apollo 12. So learning about the mission, um, going through them, looking for anything unusual, looking for anything new, looking for any images that really just stood out that we haven't seen before, but also looking for clues in the film that, you know, a lot of them are just like a black square. They're so underexposed, but you could there, there are there is detail in them or there's clues as to what when you follow them in 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 order, what might be coming up if it's something hmm. interesting. Right. So I'd do a quick um edit on them and see if there's anything interesting. And if there is, I'd kind of park it and say, okay, that's tagged and go through, work my way through like that. And then go back to those and do a more serious edit on them, pull out the detail, 
can take like the front cover was two days because I knew it was a very historic photograph. It was an amazing right. portrait. Right. It's something we've almost never see that photograph. Um, so to get it right, then that's what takes the time as well as going through them. It's processing them and getting them absolutely right. Wow. And is for people watching the video version of this episode, they can see, you know, a difference in the exact same image between the older version of a photograph and the newer one that you've produced. Um, what was your process like when you said, okay, I'm going to have this, take this photograph. Um, what tools did you use? What was your, I imagine you did an awful lot of app smashing, but, <laughs> <laughs> but did you um, also you do anything crazy or what? what the, the, I suppose the, the, the craziest thing, I suppose, is, is this, I suppose it's quite an unusual thing to apply this stacking technique to the film uh this is to the movie film <clears throat> rather than the Hasselblads this is something that's used in astrophotography a lot yeah I was gonna say yeah, yeah so people that know of astrophotography will know oh stacking yes I know what you mean now the average person doesn't have a clue what stacking is it's not that easy to explain <clears throat> but I'll try so they took this video film cam uh, this uh, movie footage camera so lots of frames if you can separate that out into the individual frames, stack them on top of each other and perfectly align them and then consolidate them, you basically, you can keep the signal, which is the image, but because the noise is in a random place on every frame, you can average out the noise. So the signal to noise ratio improves, the clarity improves, there's more detail. And you can also then push the standard kind of digital processing harder as well. So it's a double whammy. You know, you've got the stacking, and you yeah. can then process it harder. And that what looks like a really grainy piece of cine film suddenly becomes almost like a high resolution photograph. And we can pull out just incredible detail from that. Hmm. Yeah, I think a lot of people don't realize that most of the astronomical photographs one sees is actually created from dozens or hundreds of these black and white basically black and white images taken at different frequencies. Yeah, long yeah, long exposures or yeah. lots of frames stacked yeah. or all yeah. kinds of, of, of wizardry yeah. to pull out something that's very faint and be, to be able to see it. It's got yeah. similar principles, yeah. Yeah. Um, so as you went through, which, which image, or can you give us an idea of like one of the images that might have had the most impact on you that just made you go, Oh, that's what was there. <laughs> uh, possibly the, the cover. I know it's obvious to say because it's the front cover. <clears throat> I mean, the Armstrong one, from a historical point of view, right. it yeah. impacted, you know, I, I was in this office actually doing that. <clears throat> that was about 10 years ago. Um, and it was late at night. Everyone had gone to bed when I do a lot of my editing. And I didn't know what to expect from the stacking process on this type of film. Right. And I, as I was doing it, I, you know, my heart was pounding. I was when I started to see what was coming out. It was almost like, you know, an archaeologist brushing the dust off. Uh, or if you imagine something out of focus, and then you turn the focus knob, and suddenly, mm. and I was just, I couldn't believe what what I was looking at. You know, and I knew what this meant. It was, you know, a, a really clear image of Neil Armstrong on the moon. You could see his face, which is eyelid. Yeah. So I don't think anything will ever kind of top that. Uh, but the front cover's got a bit of everything. It was a very underexposed photograph. We almost never see it. It's become this incredible atmospheric portrait. It's the only photograph of an Apollo astronaut in the full suit and bubble helmet in the lunar module. It's a historic moment because he's actually looking up through the docking window, undertaking the first ever docking in space between two crewed spacecraft. I spoke to Rusty Schweikart, who took that photograph, um, and he said, I can't tell you how hard he's concentrating in that moment. You know, this is the first time they'd ever mm -hmm. undertaken the docking. Right. The controls right. were set up to look forwards out of the windows for landing on the moon, but because right. they were testing it in Earth orbit, he was looking up the, through the docking window, so he had to translate through 90 degrees all of those movements. They were in a spacecraft that couldn't get them home. There was no heat shield because it was the lunar module that they were testing. So if they didn't right. dock to the command module that had the heat shield, they were in trouble. They're in, big, they're in trouble. So it's yeah. high pressure, historic moment, concentrating hard, and yet it also happens to be this cinematic, atmospheric portrait. So that has a bit of everything in it. 
and hence, wow. you know, being on the front cover. Wow, incredible, incredible. <laughs> so what do you hope that people get from this book, from this work? I'd like people to, you know, learn more about the other missions. You know, there was more than just Apollo 11. There was more than just Neil Armstrong. You know, Apollo 7 through to Apollo 17. We're approaching the 50th anniversary of Apollo 17 now. Um, and also just to feel like this is as close as they can get to making that journey themselves, <clears throat> you know, to step on board, ride along with these space explorers and what are the greatest ever human expeditions, look out the windows they looked out of, see what they saw, how they saw it. So I've been lucky enough to have some of those select few humans that actually made this journey to critique the images, to help, to tell me what I need to get across in the processing to accurate, accurately represent what they witnessed. So I want someone to read it. The There's captions on each photograph. So I've done a lot of research as to who took the photograph, what are we looking at, any quotes from the astronauts the moment they were taking these photographs, you know, to put them into even more context. And that tells the story of the whole Apollo program through the imagery. So to go on and just go and make this journey and and ride along, you know, and, and learn about, yeah, there was more than just Neil Armstrong. Absolutely. And so what do you think was your biggest challenge in creating this? At time. To get through 35. <laughs> to get through 35. At patience. Um but I, I, I enjoyed I enjoyed it all. You know, it's such important historic footage. Every now and then, every it may be only be every several hundred that I looked at, I would come across a gem, a Neil Armstrong, a cover shot of um of McDivitt. Um Alan Shepard's golf ball. So he hit two balls. The second he said he went miles and miles, we've never been able to find that. I found his golf ball uh, wow. and worked out exactly how far, I found wow. his divot and worked out exactly how far he'd hit it. So, you know, there's moments like that that just keep you going. It's quite an addictive process, actually. And hmm. by the end, I was actually starting to get quite disappointed that I know that's it. You know, right. I've been through all 35,000, I've been through every frame of 60 millimeter film. There's nothing left now from Apollo. Um, but I've uncovered so many great images, I think, and, and a lot of new things that, um, yeah, I'm, I'm really happy with it, with the end product. Amazing. And finally, what's your, what's your next project? What's next for Andy Saunders? I'm going to work uh, on effectively a prequel. So the Gemini missions. So mm. the missions, the project that was before Apollo that paved the way. Mm -hmm. The photography from there is absolutely incredible. So I'm going to undertake the same process. <clears throat> every still, every every image that ended up on a piece of film, I'm going to apply the stacking technique. I'm going to apply digital processing to the original film, uh, and and yeah, that will be next. So people can go to ApolloRemastered.com and learn more about the project. They can the book's available. I'm on social media at Andy Saunders underscore one. If anyone wants to go and find out more i'm always doing new stuff you know i'm posting images from artemis so there's there's lots for me to uh to get on with and to share right well thanks so much babe for being on the show and it was fabulous talking with you okay thank you for having me on and that was andy saunders author of apollo remastered from black dog and leventhal publishers check it out anywhere you get your awesome space book Now, hold on to your spacesuits, because we're about to embark on the next great adventure in space exploration. Oh, I'm holding on. Believe me, I'm holding on. The Artemis program, NASA's plan to bring humans back to the moon, isn't just about setting foot once again on the lunar surface. It's about setting the stage for human missions to Mars and beyond. Plus, it has a really cool name. It's like a game of cosmic hopscotch and the moon is just our first hop. Okay, I promise I won't carry this analogy too far. He will, in fact, carry that analogy too far. Uh, the moon will serve as a great stepping stone to deeper space, 
testing new technologies and training for longer missions. Future explorers will use the moon as a testing ground for living and working in space before we take the plunge and set forth to Mars. It's just like hopscotch. Yeah. Now, in order to journey to other worlds, we need to develop a means of easily getting to our planetary companion. Uh, with the Artemis program and the NASA plans to use the Space Launch System or SLS rocket and the Orion spacecraft to send humans back to the moon. Over time, we'll be building up a system a bit like a lunar Uber, but without the surge price. <laughs> Uh, once we establish a permanent presence on the moon, we can start thinking about our next move, Mars. Uh, let's be honest, Mars has always been the cool kid on the block. Everybody knows it. Everyone's gonna want to live there. It's got red dust, water, and let's not forget about all those cool rock formations, okay? Tell me what you know about red dust. Plus, it's the ultimate survival test. Never mind New York. If we can make it on Mars, we can make it anywhere. Hopscotch. <laughs> yeah, about that. Uh, the Artemis program is more than just a trip back to the moon. It is a stepping stone to humanity's next great adventure in space exploration. It's about testing new technology, training for longer missions, and most importantly, preparing for our next big move, Mars. So let's strap on our spacesuits and get ready to take the next giant leaps to the moon and beyond. Hey, while we're on the subject, Mars is also our next step on this show as well. Hopscotch. Next week on The Cosmic Companion, we'll talk about our future on Mars. We're going to be joined by James Burke, Executive Director of the Mars Society. Attention all viewers and listeners of The Cosmic Companion. Reports indicate the end of this episode is approaching. Do not panic, like you humans do so very often. Okay, maybe panic a little. But there will be an episode next week. So all is not lost yet. Signing off. Uh, since you made it to the end of the show, I'm just gonna go ahead and assume you enjoyed it. I mean, it's not like you just fast forwarded to the end of the episode. Gigi? Mm -mm. Why? Why? Why would anyone do that? So, I don't know, maybe you know someone else who might like the Cosmic Companion? I mean, share it, like it, comment on it. Send the episode all over the internet, why don't you? It can't hurt. Probably. Clear skies. <laughs>